sometime during the Obama presidency. They're now pulling the rug away from under the feet of the people. They're becoming rapidly a non-manufacturing country. Any country that can't manufacture its own goods, even for self-defense, therefore is no, no longer sovereign, independent, and able to sustain itself, which tells you that this is all part of the plan. It started with the very um, the beginning when you established that there was uh, a Federal Reserve System given the power of the state to create money out of nothing, and to do so without any regard uh, to uh, the will of the people, without any regard to what's behind the money system. In other words, strictly political and economic motives for the bankers and the politicians. Once you granted that power to a group, the Federal Reserve System, the economic crisis was inevitable. This has happened before. Every time in history when uh, the government was given the power or a group of banks in conjunction with the government was given the power to expand the money supply at will, those economic systems always wound up in crisis and always collapsed. So there's no reason to believe that the United States was given some kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card, an exemption from the processes of history. So the economic crisis began at the very beginning, and as a matter of fact, when the founders of the Federal Reserve System met on Jekyll Island back in 1910 and were drafting the, um, the Federal Reserve Act, one of the things they discussed was how to pass on the inevitable losses to the taxpayers. They knew that inevitably something like this would happen, and they knew that uh, there had to be some way to, to get out of it without destroying the banks, of course, because they were the banks. And they said, aha, we'll go into partnership with the government, we'll take our cartel agreement and pass it into law, call it the Federal Reserve Act, and we'll make the taxpayer come online and be responsible to bail us out if and when, when the failure finally comes. Who's going to soak up the derivatives? Who's going to soak up the debt? Who's going to be penalized? And right now, it looks like Wall Street's getting bailed out, and the little guy and the middle of Main Street America are all going to uh, pay, pay the uh, penalty. Can the economy be turning around here, our happy days here again? And can we actually have growth without jobs? Is this an oxymoron, jobless recovery? We're going into the greatest depression. There will be no job growth. Unemployment will continue to escalate. Along with it, so too will crime, poverty, kidnappings, boss napping,s And the more things spin out of control, the harder the hammer is going to come down by the federal government to keep everyone in control. Power is much, much more important to them than money is. Money is only a waste of the means. Power is the end result. The elite's main goal is to destroy national sovereignty and individual independence. To consolidate their grip on power, the banksters create artificial debt bubbles that are mathematically impossible to pay back. These are those sinister toxic assets, the complex financial instruments that they talk about but never really name. They're paper based on paper. Their credit default swaps, collateralized debt obligations, mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, structured investment vehicles, auction rate securities, and so on down the line. It's an immense mass of cancerous, fictitious, speculative paper bloated in value, impossible to bail out. Triage the derivatives on their books. There's no way to bail out a $1.5 quadrillion dollar black hole of derivatives, but nevertheless they tried. The Wall Street cronies are crooks. Uh, if you leave the uh, vault to the uh, bank open, these people are going to help themselves. The, the job of the government is to make sure there's somebody there to make sure the vault is closed and very few people have the uh, combination. I'm William K. Black, Associate Professor of Economics and Law at the University of Missouri. Kansas City. I was a senior regulator in a number of different positions during the heart of the savings and loan crisis. On a staff level, I led uh, the re-regulation of the savings and loan industry. 
the purpose of regulation and effective criminal prosecution is to make sure that cheaters don't prosper, that honest manufacturers win in competition. The primary driver of the current crisis is accounting control fraud. These are frauds led by the CEOs of the major lending institutions and major banks and institutional uh, buyers of toxic waste product. How did it start? It started with mortgages, particularly non-prime mortgages. In September of 2004, the FBI warned that there was an epidemic of mortgage fraud, their words, and that this epidemic of mortgage fraud would cause an economic crisis at least as large as the savings and loan debacle if it wasn't stopped. The FBI found that 80% of the mortgage fraud was being induced by the lenders, not by the borrowers. You know, much of the rage has been against the borrowers, but if you want rage, it should be at the CEOs who became fabulously wealthy by following a strategy based on fraud. The Wall Street people and their uh, friends here at the uh, Federal Reserve and at the U.S. Treasury and down down the Washington Mall here at the U.S. Capitol. That's where the damage was done and uh, if people want to vent their anger they need to vent it uh, against these people. Between the Bush-Paulson administration and the Obama, Summers, Geithner, Volcker administration, there's really a total continuity of economic and financial policy. Geithner was on board at the Fed, the New York Fed, dealing with all these institutions. He didn't get it. And then we had this uh, fellow who came up afterward, Mr. Friedman. He was on the Goldman Sachs board, and uh, he didn't last too long as a Fed chairman. Why? Because he had a conflict of interest. Is it possible that there's so much conflict of interest here that all you folks don't even realize that you're helping people that you're associated with and you should be recusing yourself for America's um, ethics? Uh, I, uh, you know, I behaved with the... Uh, you don't think you should have recused yourself when you asked Lehman to go in bankruptcy, you didn't put Bear Stearns in bankruptcy, and then you folded Mayor Lynch into, I mean, isn't there some point where you've got to say, hey, I've got a conflict of interest here? You don't feel any kind of scintilla of ethics on this thing at all? Uh, totally. I, I, I operated very consistently with the, in the ethic guidelines I had as Secretary of the Treasury, and when it became... Uh, when it became clear that that uh, we had some very significant issues with Goldman Sachs and with with why didn't you recuse with, yourself with Morgan then? Stanley? What I did then, it would have been very wrong for me to recuse myself. What I did was I went and got a waiver from the ethics agreement because when we had concerns, who was in charge of the ethics agreement? What? Who's in charge of the ethics agreement that we, you got a waiver? We, we have, we have an uh, office of, of ethics at Treasury, and we have a White House ethics office. So you got it from the legal counsel from the White House? We, we, we got it from the, uh, the, the, the government ethics office. So we had Snow, we had Paulson, now we have Geithner. All these people cut from the same bowl of cloth. Uh, these are not independent Treasury secretaries. They're uh, part of the problem, not part of any solution. And it would have been nice to see uh, President Obama effect some change in Treasury, but he, of course, he went and got a, a Wall Street insider uh, as his Treasury secretary. Everything that's speculative, parasitical, cancerous, bloated from all these administrations, going back to Carter and even beyond, comes together in the Obama administration with Volcker, with Summers, who's part of the uh, economic crimes under Clinton, the guy who brought you derivatives and the abolition of the Glass-Steagall firewall. You could not have gotten a more perfect setup for a takeover from a previous government, the Bush regime, uh, than the Obama regime. Now there are some authors out there already saying that it's the same bunch, and it's true, it's the same bankers who put the same boys forward. Obama, far from helping the public and giving them something new, or giving them more power and say over their own affairs, has actually sided immediately with the bankers, who once again, once again, have robbed the public blind, 
and now they must get bailed out by your tax money. Obama does it all with left cover. He makes you think that he's somehow different from Bush, that this is somehow benevolent, that he cares about the poor. And in reality, this is the cruelest hoax and the most bogus sham. Obama is 1,000% devoted to Wall Street interests. When Wall Street says jump, Obama jumps. And again, it's about 30 to $40 for the bankers for every dollar that ever reaches an unemployed person or somebody who's on food stamps or some infrastructure building for highways. The hope with the Obama administration was that it would move us beyond this. But unfortunately, what we're seeing more and more is that Obama has brought in uh, many of the economists who bought into the system in the past. Uh, Larry Summers is a, is a very good example. And, uh, and, and so 